Do you remember at the end of last episode when I challenged you all with a puzzler? What? You, you didn't watch the entire episode? Don't you know I hide all the good stuff at the end of each episode of HTM School? Okay, so the puzzler last episode was to think about what would happen if the temporal memory algorithm was restrained to using only one cell per column. I asked how this would affect sequence learning inside temporal memory. To answer this question, we need to learn a bit about single order and high order sequence memory. Numenta research engineer, Marcus Lewis. So first order sequence memory is kind of a special case where it forms the next prediction based solely on what it's seeing right now, what it's sensing right now. The current feature causes predictions. Let's take a look at an example sequence and how these different memory systems might understand it. In this simple sequence, you can see there are some repeating patterns. Hey, I know this song. It's when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. What oh, are you doing? You're too early, you're ruining the scene. Hey man, I'm just doing my thing. That's fine, just wait for your cue. <sighs> Let's bring out single order memory to have a look at this sequence. Hi, I'm single order memory and I'm going to learn a thing and tell you about it. Oh look, there's the thing. Okay, I learned the thing. Okay, single order memory. If you hear the note E, what note is most likely to come next? That's easy. I'll just go through the whole sequence and look for all the E's and keep count of what follows them how many times. That way I can tell you that chances are good an F is going to follow an E in the sequence. But what if you knew more than one note in the sequence? Let's say you didn't hear just an E, but you heard a G right before the E. Can you refine your prediction? Wait. What do you mean before E? There's nothing before E. F comes after E. This looks like a job for high order memory. This, this looks, looks like, like a, a job, job for high order memory. High order sequence memory. It uses the current input and what has happened previously. That's right, Marcus from Dementa. I can solve this issue because I can remember more about the notes that led up to the current state. So I know that if a G is followed by an E, I can more accurately predict what comes next. And in this case, G and E will definitely be followed by C. What do you mean led up to the current state? Never mind, single order memory. Thank you guys. You told me I could have a fidget spinner if I did this for you. Later. So having one cell per column restricts each column to represent a spatial feature in only one context, meaning it only has information from the current state to make predictions about the future. This severely limits the functionality as a learning algorithm. A good sequence memory needs to recognize spatial patterns with many different contexts, and that's why we need many cells per mini column. We talked a little about bursting in the last episode, but one key idea is still missing. When a column bursts, how is a cell within the bursting column chosen to represent that new sequence in the future? Let's say that proximal input causes some columns to activate. Here's one of those columns. You can tell that this spatial input was not predicted because there are no predicted cells in this column. So the mini column bursts and every cell is activated. Now, let me introduce the idea of a winner cell. Every time a mini column becomes active, a winner cell is chosen to represent the latest step in the sequence. If there is a correctly predicted cell in the mini column, that cell is automatically the winner because it correctly predicted it would be active. However, if the column is bursting, we still need to choose a winner cell to represent this new pattern. I'm gonna explain how the selection is made in a moment, but for now, let's just choose one. Moving on to the next time step, we get a new spatial input and another set of columns are activated. Here's one of those columns. Once again, this mini column, among others, was activated because it recognized a certain spatial feature in the input space through its feed forward proximal dendritic segments. Again, this spatial feature was not predicted, so the column bursts. 
Now let's talk about how we choose a winner cell to represent this new transition in our sequence. First, we will look through these potential winners in the column to see if any of them almost predicted the last input. This means that they have distal segments that match the previously active cells, but their permanence values are not high enough to form a connection. If they had been connected, the cell would have been in a predictive state, and the column would not have burst. Remember that we look at all the segments of all the bursting cells, which can lead to any other cells in the structure. So this graphic is a bit misleading because it's focusing on just a few columns. There are probably thousands of columns involved, dozens of which are activated by this feedforward input simultaneously. So given that this was the winner cell last time, if this top cell happened to have a segment to that cell, it might become the winner, even though it's not yet fully connected. But what if there were no matching segments at all? Let's investigate that with the next time step. The setup for this is exactly the same as our previous steps. Spatial input activates some number of columns. Here's one of them, which is active because it recognized some spatial feature of the input. All the cells activate because there were no cells predicting this input. Here's the cell in the last example column that was the winner cell. But perhaps none of the active cells in the current column have any segments that match any previous winner cells. So we basically have no clue what's going on, and we need to represent this as a brand new sequence. In this case, we're going to inspect all the bursting cells to find the cell with the fewest number of segments and make that the winner cell. This ensures that we are utilizing as many cells as possible and not overloading cells with meaning unnecessarily. It's also important that we randomly break any ties that occur when finding this winner cell. Now that the winner cell selection is done, we need to either create segments or grow synapses from all the active cells in this bursting column to cells representing the previous state. We do this by increasing the distal permanence values between these active cells and the winner cells in the last time step. Remember that we're applying this learning to every winner cell in every active column in this time step. And a couple of notes before we close up this episode. Every active column will have a winner cell, even if it's not bursting, in which case the winner is the active cell in the column. Also, not all columns must burst at the same time. It's quite typical for input noise to introduce bursting because this noise creates many different sequences that are still very similar. So while completely new spatial input will burst all the columns, many times subtle deviations in spatial features will only burst some of the columns. This brings our discussion about HTM sequence memory to a close. However, there's a lot more to HTM than just sequence memory. HTM sensory motor theory uses essentially the same learning algorithms I've gone over in HTM school so far to do 3D object recognition. In the next few episodes, I'll be talking about bigger structures like cortical columns, multiple layers of cortex, and how interactions between cortical columns and layers allow your brain to do sensory motor integration to recognize objects in three-dimensional space based upon motor commands and sensory input. If this sounds exciting to you, please like this video and subscribe to the HTM School channel where we will continue to provide educational materials about hierarchical temporal memory. Thanks again for watching HTM School.